Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kambi Yusranavardi, uh, a co-president of Columbia, D.C., and a graduate of the School of Engineering and Applied Science. Uh, first, let me thank our partners, the Yale Club of Washington, D.C., and Princeton Club of Washington, D.C., and their members for being with us this evening. We are very honored to have uh, Professor James M. Banner, Jr. to talk to us about revisionist history, what it is, why we have it, and how to think about it. And this will be in conversation with uh, Professor Banner's a student and uh, a history buff in his own right, Alan Farkas. James M. Banner Jr. holds a BA from Yale and a PhD from Columbia. He was a member of the history department of Princeton from 1966 to 1980, um, which he left to found the American Association for the Advancement of Humanities. A former Guggenheim Fellow, he is the author of many books and articles in American history, the discipline of history, education, and public affairs. They include to the Hartford Convention, Federalist and the Origins of Party Politics in Massachusetts, 1789-1815, uh, co-authored with Harold C. Cannon, The Elements of Teaching and the Elements of Learning, Being a Historian, an Introduction to the Professional World of History, and most recently, The Ever-Changing Past, Why All History is Revisionist History, which is the top, uh, subject of today's discussion. Without further ado, Alan, James, take it away. Thank you, Cam Bees, very much. And many thanks to, to you and the Columbia Alumni Association of Washington, D.C. for organizing uh, this event. Uh, and thanks as well to the Washington, D.C. clubs of Princeton and Yale for, for co-sponsoring. And of course, uh, a big thank you to uh, all of those uh, of you who have uh, 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 joined us uh, this evening. Um, the fact that you've chosen to be with us uh, suggests that you believe uh, history matters. Uh, this sentiment was so beautifully expressed in the movie Nomadland, the Oscar winner for Best Picture, by the central character uh, played by Frances McDormand, when she said, what's remembered lives. And I would add it lives not only individually, but it lives for us collectively uh, as well. Well, for an example of the relevance of the past to the present, we need look no further than this morning's uh, New York Times. And I direct your attention to an article here about uh, French President uh, Macron and his decision to commemorate the 200th anniversary of Napoleon's death. It turns out that Napoleon is reviled on the left and glorified by the far right. Uh, but the fact that this planned commemoration is causing so much controversy is an indication of how the French view uh, Napoleon's legacy in terms of their own uh, national uh, identity. Well, my conversation with Jim Banner is going to certainly touch on his book, but we're not going to cover it in depth. And, and therefore, I'd like to say uh, a few words about the book. Um, this is it, the ever-changing past, why all history is revisionist history. My wife and I had an opportunity to uh, review the final manuscript last fall uh, in, connection, in conjunction with a seminar that uh, Jim conducted for the Yale Alumni College. I would say that this is really a history of history. Uh, we take a tour beginning with ancient times uh, up to the modern era. Uh, Jim reviews for us some of the differences in uh, different uh, revisionist histories. He traces the changes in our uh, interpretation of the causes of the French Revolution and of the American Civil War and some of the reasons behind why those revisions uh, occurred. And then finally, he concludes with an essay on history and objectivity. Now, contrary to uh, what our what can be indicated, I'm really not a history buff. Uh, like many of you, uh, I'm an occasional reader of history. And what I took away from the book um, was the opportunity to view history through the eyes of a professional historian. 
And that's what we hope to accomplish this evening. We hope that you'll leave with a better perspective on history because you uh, will have shared the perspective of a practitioner and specifically the, the perspective of Jim Banner. So Jim, first uh, a few questions about the book. Um, what do you hope uh, the reader takes away from the book? Well, Alan, um, first of all, let me thank Cambiz and Alan, who once was a student of mine and now has, as you can tell, overtaken me in eloquence and in understanding of all that he reads and much that he sees. Um, what, what I'm trying to get across to everyone who considers revisionist history is there are a number of points. Number one, revisionist history is not a product of the 1960s. Um, it's really been with us since the days of Herodotus and Thucydides 2,500 years ago. And that makes me conclude that it's inherent in historical inquiry, which is what Herodotus and Thucydides themselves together um, inaugurated uh, that many uh, centuries ago. Uh, in the second place, revisionist history, and that is changes in previous interpretations of any part of the past, changes that are brought about by new perspectives, new evidence, new methods, um, new subjects. Um, those changes inhabit no particular place on the ideological spectrum. They come from the left and the right. And obviously, I mean, it should be clear to all of you that in our day and age, to write a book about revisionist history, and I'll say something additional about it in a minute, is to seem to take issue with the right, which seems to be the location of those who most often attack revisionist history, if only because in the last 50 or 60 years, most of the changes in the history that so many people were brought up with, certainly someone who's my age with my uh, color hair and so on was brought up with, um, the changes that have come upon our understanding of the past because of the introduction of new subjects, new peoples, um, new perspectives, new politics, new ideology. Those changes have lodged mostly, but not entirely, on the left. And yet the right, as I try to make clear in the book, and as I'll be happy to try to make further clear this evening, is that the right continues to win a lot of the interpretive battles, if you want to look at them as right or left. To which, therefore, I add the following, that in, in, in considering revisionist history, I've considered it as a phenomenon. Namely, it's, it's epiph my concern is epiphenomenal. I'm not looking at the literature of the Civil War or the French Revolution or the changes of dynasties in uh, China or the emergence of women to historical agency. I'm not looking at any particular subject. I'm looking at the phenomenon of revisions to existing revisions of interpretations of the past. And so I'm trying to generalize and I really don't take positions that are political. I don't think revisionist history has a political place. It is a process that historians have used for two and a half millennia to try to make sense of their subject, which is change over time in the past. Jim, uh, before I ask you the next question, let, let me just uh, make clear to our uh, participants that you and I will have a conversation here that will last about 45 minutes, maybe a little bit more than that. Uh, but we urge uh, everyone to uh, formulate questions for you um, because uh, currently we've got uh, over 150 participants on this call. Uh, we can't people have we can't people we can't have people raising their hands. Uh, either actually or virtually. Uh, and therefore, if you would avail yourselves of the chat room and uh, write, your, write your questions in, uh, and then um, before too long, uh, we'll leave our conversation and we'll go to those uh, questions. One other point about, uh, about the book. Uh, there is a discount for those of you that are participating in this seminar. 
Uh, I think the link for that discount is to be found uh, in the chat room as well. So Jim, um, what compelled you to, to write the book? <laughs> That's an interesting question. And I think um, we'll e expose to um, all of us on this, uh, on, at this meeting, um, how historians can come to the subjects they come to. Mine was accidental. I found myself one afternoon some years ago with a colleague in the Supreme Court chambers of Justice Clarence Thomas. And we were having a very lively uh, and engaged conversation uh, about history because he told my colleague and I that he was spending the summer reading the history of American slavery. We were there because my colleague and I were leading about uh, 55 or 60 uh, high school teachers through what came to be known as Constitution Boot Camp. It was one month of a really intensive course on the origins of American constitutional government. And the justice had agreed to speak to the students and he wanted to be briefed. When he realized he had, it dawned on him fully that he had two um, historians there, he proudly told us that he was reading the history of American slavery. So we asked him what he was reading. And he was reading books by John Hope Franklin and John Blasingame and Kenneth Stamp, but not, he said, the revisionists. Now, we didn't quite figure out what he meant by that. Probably the book Time on the Cross by Robert Fogel and Stanley Engerman. But it turns out that all the books he was reading were revisionist histories. They had changed the face of our understanding of slavery um, after the Second World War uh, from the interpretations that had existed before the Second World War. But when we told the justice and he's a very engaging, very open, very articulate, very sunny man. Whatever you think of his jurisprudence, when we told him that he was reading revisionist history, if you had been sitting and you've been a fly on the wall, you would have said, oh, now he's gonna say, well, tell me what you mean. He didn't, it made him very uneasy. And the fact that we'd had that discussion and the fact that he revealed that uneasiness stuck with me for a long, long time. I could have written books about other things, but it, it turned out that a book about revisionist history hadn't been written since, or published since 1929. And that's a long time ago. And there were many fresh ways to think about the subject itself. And in fact, no one had really grappled with it the way I intended to do. So I wrote the book and you're getting the results of it. But let me say that other people, you, Alan, Cambiz, anyone would go with the subject differently. I have had no signposts. There's no literature about revisionist history. So I made up the contours of the subject as I went along. I don't know if they're correct. They're certainly not complete, um, but it's my thinking that you're getting the results of tonight. Not, not someone who's participated in a fast literature because there is no literature on the subject. So Jim, you, you define uh, all historical works as revisionist, but certainly they're not all revisionist to the same degree. How do you sort out historical works along this spectrum of revisionism? Uh, I, I think that all works of history are prospectively or potentially revisionist. One treats, one should treat every work of history you read as somewhat different in some respects from every other history on the subject that's been written. Even, even the endless works of biography of say George Washington, we're not learning too much more about George Washington's life and career and, and meaning and so on, but each of those go at the subject differently. So they're somewhat different. And yet I think that just to talk about, and I think Alan grasps this, this reality to talk about revisionist history as if it's some kind of undiscriminated whole is wrong. Um, and I've tried to distinguish different types of revisionist history. One, for example, is transformative revisionist history. It's the kind of change that Bishop Eusebius of Caesarea in the fourth century of the Christian era, the kind of transformative change that he inaugurated by inaugurating Christian historiography, and we're all the legatees of that change. 
but it changed the way in the West we did history from the pagan classic uh, manner of Herodotus, Thucydides and their successors and to the way in which it was done really into the 19th century. Then there's a kind of, I would call philosophical history. That's the argument between Herodotus and Thucydides, between Herodotians and Thucydideans, whether the, the correct, the right, the meet, the fittest, the most useful form of history is in the Thucydidean terms about statecraft, men, warfare, relation between states, politics, institutions, or Herodotus's more omnivorous approach, which is social, cultural, intellectual, political, legal, military, and so on. And then there are revisionist histories that are brought about by new ways of being able to evaluate evidence, DNA, for example, which completely blasted open our understanding of Thomas Jefferson and his relationship to his slaves because of his relationship with his slave concubine, Sally Hemings. There's LIDAR, which can now discover civilizations, sites that are buried underground. Um, there are, and, and so on, there are different kinds of revisionist history and it all depends on the scale because my argument would be that you could take a tiny battle, let me make up one of the Civil War, just the, the Battle of X. The Battle of X has been always written about in a certain way until a group of letters are discovered by some soldier who participated in it, who shows that in fact, the, 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 the South, the, the, the Confederate troops didn't lose the battle as was always said, because the Northern forces arrayed against them were superior. It was rather because the orders from a higher command in the Confederate army never got to the group of Confederate soldiers who were trying to hold off the, the Union troops. Now, that's not a major revision of Civil War history, but in this context of and the scale of that one battle, it does change it. So it's revisionist within that scale, whereas you don't consider it revisionist in the larger scale of the history of the American Civil War. And those are the kinds of distinctions I'm trying to make so that as you read, as we read, as you and I read works of history, we can distinguish different kinds and different scales, um, uh, different powers of different changes in orthodox or just previous interpretations of the past. Mm -hmm. Jim, could you walk us through an example of revisionist history? Uh, uh, you know, against some uh, important event or period of time. Well, let, let me take, yes, let me take the smaller one of the ones, the, the, the more compact ones of one of the ones I've already mentioned, and that is Jeffersoniana. Um, the, 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 the accusation that Thomas Jefferson was, was, was having sexual relations with one of his slaves was first brooded in 1803 in a Philadelphia newspaper by Thomas Challenger, Challenger. Um, and um, no one wanted to believe it. It was rumored in Virginia that that was the case, but it was never credited. And those who, who idolized Thomas Jefferson, and there's every reason that we should continue to think of him as a great major figure in American history, they did their best to suppress that rumor and it was suppressed for decades. And um, it was protected by the historians of the 20th century who were Jefferson scholars. Most of them were Southerners, they were white gentlemen. Um, it was inconceivable to them that their idol would have engaged in sexual relationships with a black woman who was enslaved to him. Well, but then some women began to pay attention to the rumors. Um, first was Fawn Brody who had been uh, trained in, in, in uh, uh, she'd been uh, undergone uh, analysis, uh, Freudian analysis. She was very aware of, of suppressive tendencies in people and so on. She began to look into Jefferson's biography in a different way and discovered that one, uh, that a child had been born to Sally Hemings nine months after every trip home that Thomas Jefferson took in a certain period in his life. And that 
got everybody's attention. And I reviewed Von Brody's book, by the way. Alan, it may have been when you were a student at Princeton, and I was called in by one of the great Jefferson scholars who was on my faculty at Princeton, who just uh, tore into me for having raised this uh, positively reviewed Brody's book and given uh, a kind of salute to her, uh, her interpretation. Well, it turns out that with the arrival of DNA evidence and with the, with the lawyerly um, attack on the way in which evidence had been used by Annette Gordon Reed, our contemporary, a contemporary of mine, um, it, it, it turned out that Jefferson, in fact, had fathered children by Sally Hemings. Now, it isn't that historical argumentation changed our understanding of the reality. It was the application of legal argumentation on the one hand and of DNA science on the other that changed our understanding of what in fact had occurred at Monticello in the late 18th and early 19th century. So that is the way in which different under, new understandings of the past come about. And of course it changes, therefore our understanding of the words we they're all uh, that, uh, you know, that, that our, our, our lives are dedicated to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It gives a different tenor to our understanding of Jefferson's words about freedom and independence in all of his letters and documents. And so it had a profound influence on our understanding of the origins of the American nation. So Jim, I'm, I'm, I'm interested that your, your colleague at Princeton uh, sort of called you on the carpet and uh, was critical of your review of this, uh, of this book. And, and I'm curious as to what extent that's a typical reaction of those historians that have, a, that have written histories of a certain period. And uh, to what extent are those histories readily accepted? Um, to what extent uh, do we find um, that we have to go through a period of time where we have revision upon revision until we may see a paradigm shift uh, in how a particular period or event uh, is, uh, is viewed. And, I, and I'm thinking here of your former colleague at Princeton, uh, Thomas Kuhn, and his structure of scientific revolution. Uh, Kuhn made those points with respect to scientists, their reluctance to accept new findings, and, 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 and with uh, the accumulation of evidence, these paradigm shifts. To what extent are there parallels here between historians and scientists? I think, I think you've used the right word. I think there are parallels. They're not exact attitudes. And um, as I think we've learned since Tom Kuhn's book in the 1960s, um, it, it, historians of science now understand that science is always um, the product of human agency and human disposition. And here is something that I've tried to introduce into the discussion of the subject. We cannot ignore the role of human temperament. I've gone at the subject the way I have because I am the person I am with the origins I have, with the interests I have, um, with the upbringing I've had, with the career I've had. Others would go at it differently. And so it seems to me, Alan, that changes come about and changes are resisted in part, not just by the cast of mind and the ideological situation and the sex and the ethnicity of people, but also by their inner selves. And that's why we should never be surprised that there are people who don't seem to be fit for the kinds of history they produced. Women who are not feminist historians of African-American men who don't seem to agree with other African-American scholars. And thus it is, for example, that I took up the subject because the conversation I had with Justice Thomas struck home with me when it might not have struck home, Alan, with you or with anyone else um, at, at this uh, gathering this evening. So, um, and, and 
there's always going to be resistance to change in historical interpretation because too much is at stake in the orthodox or the older ways. And we see that now with um, efforts to bring down statues and monuments to Confederate generals and Confederate soldiers. Um, there's a lot of resistance and I think that should be expected. I think that's the way human societies across the face of the earth work. Um, change does not come easily, it does not come swiftly, and it certainly does not come. And here I think the historiography of the American Civil War makes that clear. It does not come when veterans of an event as major of, as the American Civil War are alive to contest changes in interpretation of that event. Same thing happened with the Enola Gay controversy, controversy on the Mall in the 1990s. The veterans groups, the Air Force Association, um, resisted, effectively resisted the effort to reinterpret the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the National Air and Space Museum. They would just not have any of it. And politicians and the Smithsonian had to cave to that kind of political pressure. I would wager, I would put down at least 50 cents, that if someone tried to mount that same exhibit today at the National Air and Space Museum, it might go up because there is not the force in the veterans community to contest um, such an event as there was 25 years ago. So the passage of people involved in an event from the scene makes it easier to open up the canvas to new interpretations, new ways of interpreting the past. Mm -hmm. So Jim, you're, the tour that you take us on in your book uh, is a tour that really applies to Western civilization. It makes no pretense of applying to the world as a whole. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, uh, the theory of revisionist history as, as you lay it out seems all well and good for a society in which there's a free flow of ideas and uh, unfettered intellectual inquiry. But what about autocratic societies? What about places like China and Russia and Turkey? What does revisionist history look like there uh, in those places? And what do historians look like in those places? Well, <laughs> you have once again put your finger on, a, on, on I think, which one of the two central subjects, uh, the two central elements of this larger subject. In authoritarian societies, there's revisionist history, there's, there's, there's historical debate, there's historical contention going on, but out of sight, unpublished, um, unavailable to the general public. We are so extraordinarily fortunate in the West, not everywhere because there are troubles brewing in Hungary and in Poland. And if you want to consider Russia, a Western country, certainly in Russia, but we are so fortunate to live in open societies. And it seems to me that historical debate is part of the evidence of the richness of life in, a, in an open society, that we should celebrate the fact that we can argue with each other, that we can debate each other, that, that historians and members of the general public all together can be at loggerheads with each other. They could be, a, be with rapiers drawn with each other because it's permitted. It's not just freedom of speech, it's the freedom to think and to argue as we wish. And um, I cannot myself separate the question of what revisionist history means and how it operates and why it exists. I cannot uh, uh, pull that, those aspects of it out without reminding myself and reminding all of us that those elements of our debate exist precisely because we have an open society. And so those of us who fight should stop and we fight with other historians, should not fight with them as being wrong. We should fight with them as participating in an effort to try to close the gap of ignorance and to get closer asymptotically to understanding any aspect of the past. That's what is allowed to us. That's our great fortune um, to live in a country like this, of which fortunately there are a good number of others. 
So Jim, let's uh, broaden our, our, our focus here. Um, I took a seminar for the Princeton grads on this, on this call. It was actually a, a precept with you my junior year, your first year of teaching. Uh, that's over uh, a half century ago. And, Hard to imagine. And, and as, it, as with everything else, uh, I'm sure you've seen enormous changes in the discipline of history. Uh, and I wonder if you could characterize for us uh, some of those changes that you've seen uh, and in that regard, uh, the role of the non-academic historian as well. Okay, Alan, let me take those uh, uh, in, in order. Um, what I'm now going to say probably gets the approval of 85% of my colleagues, but not the other 15%. The changes that my discipline has gone through in the last half century, 70 years, has transformed our understanding of the past. Why is that? Because we have introduced into our consideration, we've been forced to introduce into our consideration, the lives of people who previously had been left out of the picture. Women, in the case of the United States, African-Americans, American Indians, gays, lesbians, now transgenders, and bisexual people. That has opened, opened a, 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 a um, huge geopolitical space for all sorts of new subjects to be considered and taken up. And, and in my view, our knowledge of the past has been extraordinarily enriched as over against the way I and Alan, I think probably you too, um, were educated um, 60, 70 years ago, mostly by white men and mostly about subjects that interested white men that concerned white men, politics, institutions, diplomacy, warfare, and so on. That's no longer the case. You cannot teach history that way anymore. And those who complain that, yes, we, we, we've well, the, the political and institutional and diplomatic history is not being taught the way it used to be and the proportion it was, they're absolutely right because you have to make space in the curriculum for all of these other subjects. Now, I mean, the subjects are extraordinary. You can, you can now read about the history of sound, the history of, of, of sexual devices, the history of pencils, and most recently, I read a book, the history of bookshelves. I mean, you know, the history of footnotes. And some of these books are wonderful to read. So, I mean, in that sense, everything is available to us now to have the history if you're interested in reading it and can, and can absorb all that's written about various aspects of the past. Now, Alan, your second question was... About the, the role of non-academic historians. Look, there weren't academic historians until the 1820s and starting in Germany. Um, where Amer many Americans were trained and where uh, many Americans learned to be academic historians and ended up first on the faculty of the Johns Hopkins University. Um, so most history until two centuries ago was written by non-academic historians. They're still writing history. They write very good history, most of them. They're on the whole, as a population, much better writers than academic historians, but academic historians often have different um, um, uh, remits. I mean, their job is to learn more as deeply as possible about certain reasonably, at first at any rate in their early years, reasonably narrow segments of the past to carry on arguments with other people. And, 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 and so to deepen um, our knowledge of particular subjects. Many academics as they mature and take on larger subjects are are wonderful writers. And I give you the names of William McNeil, uh, C. Van Woodward, Richard Hofstadter, Peter Gay. You probably know the names of these and many, many other people. And yet there are fine writers of history, David McCulloch, um, Richard, uh, that's not his name, Rick Atkinson, um, Max Hastings, uh, who write wonderful works of history deeply rooted in evidence and other people's work that don't hold academic appointments. And, and as with academic faculty members, some of them are better than others. Some write better than others and so on. 
Um, but they make contributions and they certainly make contributions to all of you at a gathering like this who probably read many of them because they synthesize the work of academic scholars and people who've been burrowing away in the archives for years and who collectively have brought into being a body of knowledge about a particular large subject. And my only, my, my principal beef with writers of history is that they take, they take on subjects that are very confined, biographies, wars, battles, and they also are drawn to subjects that either have histories or um, catch their hearts. Um, I had a conversation once with a historian well-known, whose name is well-known to all of you, and um, he'd given, he was going to write a biography about, uh, do a biography of two people. It turned out he gave up one of them, and I asked him, why did you give him up? And he said, because I can't stand him. Well, that's nice, but history cannot be made up of love letters. And uh, there have to be biographies of Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin, and there have to be histories of uh, Holocaust, and there have to be histories of slavery. You don't write love letters to these subjects, but you have to come to grips with them historically. And that is where I think um, that's the principal failure of non-academic historians, that too many of them fail to take on the really tough um, subjects and argue and come and have themes and have arguments and positions that are, um, are, are different from uh, the, the ideological or historical or uh, positions of academic historians. I wish there would be more argument among those people. Jim, let's talk about the role of history uh, to the present. Um, and certainly uh, revisionist history is alive and well in the United States. Uh, we're seeing a significant revision in our understanding of the role of race uh, in our country, uh, for a large part under the banner of Black Lives Matter, a movement that began in uh, 2013 with the, with the killing of uh, Trayvon Martin. Um, in the last year alone, we saw some 94 Confederate monuments removed and an, 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 an additional 74 uh, other public symbols of the uh, Confederacy uh, removed. And of course, you and I need, need look no further than, uh, than our uh, Princeton University, uh, where one of Princeton's proudest sons the exemplar of the slogan, Princeton, the nation's service, the past president of the university, as well as the past president of the United States, Woodrow Wilson, has fallen from grace. Uh, and in June, we saw his name removed from a residential college at Princeton and from the school that I attended as an undergraduate, the School of Public and, uh, and International Affairs. First question in this regard, to what extent do you think historians have contributed to the rethinking of race in America. Recent what, Alan? The rethinking of the role of race in America. I think they've been central to it. They couldn't have done, done it alone. And by the way, the, the arguments that we're having now, the political pressures that's being brought to bear by African-Americans and their allies among non-African-Americans did not originate in the last 10 years. I mean, they really, they really, I mean, they've been building throughout the 20th century, certainly, but they really are post-World War II. It's a post-World War II phenomenon when a new generation of historians um, came of age, joined academic faculties, and just would not put up with the pieties of their predecessors. Um, we could not see the political pressures that we are experiencing today exist and be defined as they are without the work of historians to unearth the realities of first slavery, then of the freed blacks after the Civil War, and then of course with the realities and the failures of our modern civil rights movement starting in the 50s and 60s. Now I'm not, if you were to ask me what percentage of, of the new understanding and the new politics are historians um, responsible for, I would 
I would not give you one because I have no idea. And I'm not saying it proudly about historians. It's the, it's the role that history can play. It's one of the functions of historical uh, argumentation. And I'm using the word function rather than use very purposefully. Historical knowledge has a use when it's put to use, but one of the functions of historical knowledge is to provide the grounding for argument to take place. And if it turns out to be so, for political change to take place. And um, without the knowledge that has been unearthed in the last 75 years about the African-American past and about racism over historical time in the United States, we wouldn't have had um, the kind of change that we're seeing now. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced of that. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean, however, that Black Lives Matter and what so many of us hope for is going to emerge fully victorious. We don't know what's going to come and we don't know what counter pressures are going to be. And we don't know when historians will begin arguing with, them, with themselves to the degree that there'll be a drawing back from some of the more radical positioning of historical interpretation today. It may be that some of you who are attending tonight in 50 years will be alive and be astounded by what is being argued then about the subject that we're talking about now. Jim, in, 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 continuing on this, on this topic, as a historian, if you were in charge, what would you do with these Confederate monuments? Um, I, I'd turn the job over to others. <laughs> um, well, I, 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 that's a fair question, but in some respects, it's unfair because um, I'm on the side of getting them off their pedestals. Um, but would I, would I trash them? Would I break them up? Would I put them in museums? Would I do what has been done in Prague and what has been done in Moscow? Put them in memento parks where they're there for everybody to see, but they're down off their pedestals. They're all sort of put together in the same acreage. People can wander in there, but they're, they, they're not honored anymore. I think that there, there are a lot of options now. I think I prefer that they not be broken up and sent to landfill, but um, if that's the choice of some communities, that's going to be what happens. Did I get out of that, Alan? Did I get no, out of that? No, no, Alan, okay. uh, you're very, very effectively done. Good. Um, so, of course, not all Americans are embracing this, uh, what, we, what I term the revisionist history of the role of race in America. Uh, and in fact, one might argue that the devaluing of the Confederacy and its heroes uh, is one of the factors behind this extreme polarization uh, that we see in our country. I'm curious, Jim, to what extent do you think the, this polarization has historical roots? And, and by that, I mean, to what extent do you think Americans on the right and Americans on the left view American history differently, have different American heroes, uh, identify uh, as Americans in some different fashion? I think they all do, and clearly those who um, fear and oppose the destruction and the, the toppling of Confederate monuments um, for, ver for differing reasons um, find uh, those figures reassuring and more representative of the way they want to think of the nation's history than those who are seeking the, um, the dethroning of those figures. Um, and I think that's inevitable in any society. The question is, how are both views going to be accommodated and should they be? But one of the extraordinary realities of American history is that though the Union won the Civil War, the South won the politics, that came out of the Civil War after 1876, 1877. And we're still fighting that battle. Namely, the victors were never able to cement their victory. Take as a contrary example, what happened in Germany and what happened in Japan after the war. There was no question as to who the victors were. But of course, those weren't civil wars. Those weren't Germans fighting Germans or Jap Japanese fighting Japanese. They were Americans fighting Japanese, the British fighting, and the French fighting, and the Russians fighting Germany with the United States. 
Um, so our failure to solve the problem politically um, is our failure politically to crush Southern resistance forever after the Civil War. So we continue to fight those battles and they're going to go on, I would estimate, for decades still. And it's going to be very, it may be, it may be that the passage of generations now are, is going to significantly weaken Southern and uh, Confederate related politics. Uh, but uh, I'm willing to predict it, but one can't be certain that it's going to happen. It has taken, what, it's taken well over a century, century and a half for, for the old politics to hang on. They may hang on for another century and a half. I see that we're getting uh, a good number of questions in the Q&A uh, window, and uh, Jim soon will bring our uh, discussion to an end here. So I would urge those of our participants out there that have any questions to uh, write them down and put them in the chat room. And we've got somebody from the uh, uh, Columbia Alumni Association that's going to be uh, sifting through those and, uh, and posing those, uh, those questions. So Jim, we can, we can accept the fact that objectivity and pursuit of truth, it, they're inevitably filtered through the eyes of the historian, the personality, the times in which the historian uh, lives. But I would like to think that pursuit of objectivity is still the bedrock of uh, historical inquiry. Um, and um, I also uh, have always thought uh, that pursuit of objectivity or honesty was a, a, uh, a core American value. And now I'm not so sure. Uh, the Trump administration introduced us to the concept of alternative facts. And it would be hard to find a fact more alternative than uh, uh, former President Trump's claim that he won the election. And oh, by the way, by a landslide. Uh, and the fact is, according to uh, Pew Research done in January of this year, 76% of Trump voters believe he either definitely won or probably won the election. And that amounts to a third of the uh, electorate. So I think that to a large extent, I'm speaking personally here, I've always taken for granted the value of, of uh, pursuit of truth, the value of honesty. Uh, frankly, uh, in my travels around the world, I've come to recognize that this is not a necessarily a universal value. Um, and I'm curious, what happens to historical inquiry in a society that does not value the pursuit of truth? And what challenges do our current state of affairs pose for historians today? That's a basket full of issues that we don't have time to take up. But I'd like to say about objectivity, I'd like to associate myself with what Charles Beer, the great historian of the early 20th century called it. He called the search for objective history, a noble dream. It is a dream, but it's a noble one. And to give it up would be extraordinarily costly for Western civilization and for this country. I also think that in many respects demonstrated by science, by psychology, by neuroscience, by memory studies, um, by philosophers of logic, that objectivity cannot be obtained. And that means a single, unchangeable, uh, unprovisional, a forever permanent mm -hmm. truth, or interpret in our case, an interpretation of the past. There are too many different minds, dispositions, kinds of people in the world to make that possible. But what we should do is to work to narrow the grounds of disagreement, to create small universes in which disagreement is considered to be legitimate and is tolerated, to agree with each other on 
the grounds on which disagreement probably cannot be much further lessened and learn to live with an unresolved and unresoluble um, amount of uncertainty in our lives and about the past. Now that makes me what some of you will call a postmodernist. And I think that's probably correct, but I've gotten there very slowly on, over my life. Um, I still think of the historical work based on research and, and evidence and so on that I continue to carry out to be getting closer to what should be said about a particular subject because what I have added to it and the concerns that I brought to bear that others have not and the arguments that I have invoked that others hadn't yet introduced into the subject. I don't think that my arguments are all there is to say, that they're necessarily correct, that everybody would accept them, but they're part of my effort to get to join in the search for asymptotic resolution of historical reality. Namely, the, the, the points will never meet, but they're always going gradually more slowly toward meeting in some very distant part of the universe. That's the noble dream of all history. And I dare say those in Russia and China and elsewhere who pursue historical knowledge in the quiet of their own home and in their libraries and so on, they're actuated by the same ideal as I am. The sad part is that they can't express it and can't as easily as you and I can engage in a debate about how we're going to carry on the search for historical truth. Jim, I've got, I've got one final question for you and I hope you will permit a personal question. Uh, psychologist uh, Martin uh, Segelman has suggested that there are three kinds of work. Uh, there's a job where you collect a paycheck. There's a career where you develop professionally and you advance in not only an income, but in power and prestige. And there's a calling. Uh, a calling is what uh, uh, Seligman refers to as uh, a, a being driven uh, uh, against a mission that involves some conception of the greater good. Uh, very few of us fall into that latter category. Uh, I think I know you well enough to think that you are one of the rare people who do. And I wonder if you share with us um, uh, how you, uh, how this commitment to, to history uh, uh, was initiated, how you've nurtured it, over um, a, an unconventional career and, and what you uh, uh, have hope and still hope to accomplish. Boy, Alan, um, uh, that makes me blush and it's not quite true because I don't, I think of myself as a historian, but not as a cleric. I mean, in other words, I'm not driving towards some truth. Um, I don't have some object outside of me to which I hawser my hopes and my ideals. Um, I was a historian from an early age, majored in it, loved it in school, went to graduate school, became a faculty member at your alma mater and, and so on. And I think historically as my friends, you, my wife, my children know, I think historically now, um, and it's impossible for me not to. Uh, I, I don't elevate historical knowledge over other kinds of knowledge. Um, historians pursue a certain kind of knowledge. Some, I think, do feel it as a calling. Um, I feel it as a deep interest, one that is almost native to me. It came to me when I was a teenager, I think. Um, so in that sense, I'm driven. Um, yes, and I think that the expansion of knowledge that I have helped bring about and that certainly thousands upon thousands of my colleagues, many of them extraordinarily gifted, um, have brought about is a contribution to the world. It doesn't do any harm. Um, but I'd like to leave it there. I don't want to elevate it morally or ethically above other people's occupations, whether they're business people or doctors or ditch diggers or the clerks at the store. We 
all do things for so many reasons. Um, they differ so widely. Um, and we're all in this life together. Mine happens to be the life of this historian. That's good enough for me. Okay, Jim, thank you very much. We're gonna to switch to questions from our participants and uh, turn the event uh, over to uh, the staff of the uh, Columbia Alumni Association of Washington, D.C. Hi, everyone. My name is Niako, and I'm the admin for the Columbia D.C. alumni group. I'm having a little bit of trouble turning my video on, but I think audio is working, so maybe I can start the questions while we work on the visual. Um, so, Professor Banner, we have had a couple of questions about the 1619 project and wondering about your opinions of it. Um, there was controversy both kind of over the role that journalists interpreting history played and then controversy about the historical interpretation. Um, how did you view the 1619 project as revisionist history? <laughs> I, would, I would prefer, um, I may not be allowed to by those who, there you are. Miyaku, you're, you're finally on. Nice to see you. Um, and thank you for helping out in this respect. Um, uh, I, I prefer to stand back. I noticed it was yesterday or, or, or the day before um, that um, uh, Minority Leader McConnell condemned the project because obviously condemnation of it and its claims about racism in the United States since 1619, since the um, introduction of slavery, bond servitude into the lands that became the United States. Um, that, that claim, of course, for the same, for reasons that Alan and I have already talked about, um, does not go down well with a significant portion of the population. Um, I think it would have helped had the New York Times included in the authorship of the 1619 Project more really experienced scholars of slavery and racism to state the problem and our current understandings of it, a kind of consensus view among historians, just a consensus view, but that would have been better than the way it's turned out. It would have been better if that had taken place. Um, but um, I also think that one, what we're dealing with now is not only arguments about the past and about the present, whether we are a racist nation, whether there's institutionalized racism, um, how historians and historical knowledge can help us out of that fix if it is as deep as people say. Um, that's one thing. But the other thing is that we cannot anticipate that an issue that is such a massive part of American reality is going to be resolved without conflict. So anything that the New York Times or any authors that it had hauled in, different authors, to write a report of that sort would have been met with opposition. I think it's inevitable. And I look at the arguments we're having today, not, not, not necessarily the sources of the arguments, but the arguments that we're having today are probably positive because they're bringing the issue to the attention of more people than they've had before. They're entering the classrooms, they're entering civic discourse, they're entering punditry. Um, and it, it, that, that happens often as it happened in the 1990s with the Enola Gay affair. The, the arguments that took place on the mall here and around that exhibit electrified those people who were aware of the Enola Gay and the dropping of two bombs on Japan, but had never known that historians could argue about it, that even the participants in that event, even going back to the inauguration of atomic fission, had doubts about the use of those bombs on Japan. And it was that debate that, that, that created new understanding and, and it's become diffused in the last 25 years to be sure, but new understanding of an issue that was very little uh, known about outside of historians circles. That's what's happening now. And I think that's a good thing. I think that's one of the fruits of debates about the past that this is still a living issue and it has to be dealt with as a living issue. 
we have to come to terms at some point in our history to what slavery and racism has meant in the United States. And I think the only way we're going to get through that period, and it's going to go on for decades, is going to be to argue about it, try to get more people to understand what's at stake and how we argue from the evidence that we have. That's what we're debating today. You mentioned McConnell and also Japan, and I'm going to combine a few questions here, but um, we had somebody, Mindy, said that the victims fear of the Holocaust scholars um, being forgotten as the survivors die out. Um, the Japanese government in the past few years has spent time rewriting the history around comfort women. Um, so we're seeing that politicians are somewhat politicizing history and changing it to have a more rosy, sanitized view that tells the history they want. Um, and then we had another question. Let me see if I can find it here. Um, we have, because we're in DC, a bunch of alumni who work in politics. And so Breck says that he's, you know, been around policymaking in the US at various levels and was struck by the resistance by some decision makers to ideas that conflict with ideas that they've held for a long time. So what examples do we have, if any, of changes at the policy level due to revisionist history? Um, okay, well, I'll, um, let, let me start with that last question. Um, the example that comes immediately to mind about changes at the policy level, if we're going to admit the Supreme Court into policy decisions, was the work of historians to help create the arguments in the briefs that eventuated in the decision, the 1954 decision in Brown versus Board of Education in Topeka, Kansas. Um, the arguments were framed in part by historical knowledge, in part by historians working with Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP. Um, and there's a case in which historical argument made an incredible difference to American public life, American institutions, and indeed the operations of American society. Um, the other question, first of all, so much time has passed in human existence that we can't hold a memory of everything that has ever happened in our lives. In fact, we can't possibly know of everything that's happened in human existence. No single person can do that. So there's always a danger of forgetting. And I, I do think that human populations uh, find reasons to draw on the past at different times in those populations' existence. I doubt that the Holocaust will ever be forgotten. I doubt the American Civil War will ever be forgotten, but certain less transformative events in human existence are bound to lose their salience. And it's part of the job of historians to occasionally bring them back to life and to give them a life in text, film, audio form that will not disappear so that the evidence is always available for, um, for, for reconstruction and for rediscovery. I look, I look at the arguments over the past as, as, um, as in a sort of geological way, that they're sedimentary. I mean, the same with evidence. The evidence may disappear under new layers of evidence and argument, but they're always available. They'll always be tossed up by new events, the same way that they'll be tossed up by earthquakes and by volcanoes. And um, the job of the historian is to preserve the evidence and to preserve the interpretations of the evidence for future people to use and to, to gain either um, a, a, a confidence from or to be despairing about. I mean, there's no, there's no telling what historical knowledge and historical evidence will mean to any particular population at any particular time. I'm not certain that I answered all of those questions at once, but they got me going at any rate. <laughs> well, that's great. I'm, I'm just gonna give you a whole bunch, so pick up whatever interests you. Um, so we've had a comment here that sometimes the revelation of earlier historians had in fact been influenced by fake news. 
And so maybe alternative facts that are coming out now are actually true facts. Um, and we also have a question uh, from Mark who says, is there any such thing as a definitive history or an objective history? Let's, let me take the, the, the first uh, question. I would like to know from that questioner what he or she has in mind. So if we could be more specific, um, it would help me answer the, the question. Um, there are books and articles that are called definitive histories, but I don't know who's doing the defining. To talk about a definitive history implies to me that there won't be further evidentiary findings. There won't be new methods that will show that history to be defective or limited. Um, so I don't think there's such a thing as a definitive history. There's a history that may be said and possibly accurately to go beyond any history of a particular subject that's ever been written before. That doesn't mean it's definitive. It may mean that it's more authoritative. It's better. Um, it, 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 it has, has um, advanced our understanding of a particular subject. That's fine. Definitive? I don't think so. Um, and I don't think there's an objective history. I, I do think there's a, and, and, but that doesn't mean that one should be cynical about any work of history that any of you or any of us read. Cynicism is destructive approach to anything, but to be skeptical of any history, I think is essential. You should never consider any work of history that you hold in your hands as to be the last word about it. You should never consider it to be the only way to look at the subject. If it claims to be a comprehensive view of a topic, fine, but you should understand that it's comprehensive only up to the moment it went to press and appeared as a published work. Um, so um, our work as historians is never complete. Our work as thinkers about the past is never complete. There are always new roads to travel, new thoughts to have, new methods to use. Um, that's what makes this so much fun. Well, I think most of us don't get to be historians as a profession. Uh, so we have some people here who are economists and scientists, and they're asking about the role of economic historians. How do economists contribute to history and its revision? And same thing with scientists. Should they be engaging with political discourse over the results of their research? Um, historians seem to be more involved with these, but what are your opinions on maybe other professions like economists or scientists? Well, first of all, most of the other disciplines and, some, and, and many occupations and professions have histories written about them. And let me point out that there are historians in the federal government, in the State Department, the Pentagon, advisors to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, uh, historians are implicated in, 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 in corporations, um, in nonprofit organizations. So historians are all over the place, museums, historical societies. I think all, all of you know that. Historians are also great borrowers. In other words, they borrow from economic, from economists, not just economic historians who go at the past through an economics lens, but also historians will inquire of economists as to how to interpret certain arrays of data. They'll become statisticians themselves and versed in the use of statistics. So we, we don't rule out anything. I mean, for example, we have used DNA science. We've used the work of DNA scientists to learn more about Thomas Jefferson, Monticello, slavery in Virginia, and the South. Um, we've learned, used LIDAR to penetrate the grounds in Mexico so that we know more about Mayan civilizations. I mean, we, we don't turn away anyone who can help us get at the realities of the past. Um, and I dare say the responsible economists and archeologists and medical doctors and government uh, uh, officers, they too use history when it's useful to them. We just hope that they use it responsibly. And we hope, by the way, that historians, when they use economic um, findings, use that responsibly and understand the ways in which they can be used and not used. 
mean, that's tough. I mean, crossing disciplinary boundaries is dangerous. It's difficult. It's risky. Um, but on the other hand, we all do it sometime in our professional lives. And, and sometimes it's absolutely essential. There's an interesting uh, comment here from Sally Lemons, who says there's an old Japanese film entitled Roshimon, which is the tale of a crime from three different perspectives, from the victim, the perpetrator, and then an objective observer, and they all have completely different stories. Mm -hmm. um, and so then we have a question who, somebody says, do you think it's important to engage with works of history whose perspectives or even the use of evidence have become outdated? So how can the lay reader ensure that they're reading works with proper context? Okay, um, hold both of those questions. They're different. Let me start with the first one. There's Rashomon, there's the sound and the fury, and then there's also what is now a classic film clip um, uh, of six or seven people tossing a ball among themselves. I don't know whether any of you have seen this, and an audience in which my wife and I participated some years ago, about 250 people were exposed to this film. We were told to watch it. And the person then who was leading this discussion asked how many people in the audience had seen someone clad in a gorilla suit walk among the people who were tossing the ball. And out of the 250 people, two raised their hand. Those two were not my wife and me. But this is known as inattentional blindness. In other words, we see what we're prepared to see and what our attention is drawn to, not what we're not prepared to see. And um, I think lots of us have probably been exposed to this experiment in a different way. In a, in a high school or an early college classroom, the professor or the teacher will stage an event. Someone will rush into the room, yell something, throw something at a wall and rush out. And then everybody's asked to write down a couple of paragraphs. This is what they've seen. And then they read them afterwards. And of course, they've seen different things. So that's why one has to take memory and evidence always with a grain of salt and sort of triangulate the evidence that's available in the views, the eyesight, the memory, the vision, the intentions of of the people. And that's why you get the Rashomon effect um, because everybody sees things differently. Now, the second question was, remind me so I get it right. Right, so how can a lay person make sure that they're taking into account evidence that's become outdated? How do you get the context? Well, um, I'm not certain that evidence gets outdated. Um, it gets um, added to um, and it can be Sometimes it can be demonstrated to be inaccurate or false for some of the reasons that I just um, was alluding to. But usually evidence one created, once created has some use. Now, let me take the case of Ulrich B. Phillips, the great historian of the American South, who ended up on the Yale faculty and others of his school and the Dunning School, which came out of Columbia in the teens and the 20s. These people were white males, most of them from the South and deeply prejudiced and their history reflects that. And we don't accept their historical interpretations. We think it is, that they're limited, um, they're partial, they're prejudiced. But those men created the study of Southern history. They created the great Southern collections of archives that hadn't existed before. They used what was available to them at their time as best they could. It is possible to conceive that if they were 50, 60 year old men now, that given what we've learned about the Southern African American past by now, they would not believe now what they believed then. So evidence doesn't get outdated, it gets used in a different way because we still use the evidence that they exploited and they helped save and archive. We still use that evidence, but there's been much more added to it. Our understanding has changed, we use it differently. And so the results of the use of that evidence turns out to be different, but the evidence is still the evidence. 
It's up to us to bring our interpretive abilities to bear on it and figure out what to make of it. That's the role of a historian. So maybe, I think you just answered Barry's question here, but he says, how do you separate new, histor new histories leveraging new facts, documents, or previously unavailable materials versus just alternative interpretations? Well, every interpretation of every subject is going to be alternative to every other interpretation of that subject. And the question is, which ones remain plausible? Namely, which ones um, pass the, the, the historian sniffer test? In other words, it's within the realm of what we know of human nature and human action and human capacities that what is claimed by those interpretations to have happened probably happened. Now they may differ, those interpretations may differ, but if each of them are plausible and they're then within the realm of possibility. So um, there are some histories that are proven outright false. There are some that turn out to be unacceptable to a population. That's what's happening today. But we should never assume that was written 50 or 60 or 70 years ago and is now considered to be outmoded, won't come back to life in some form in the future. Okay, maybe a, a lighthearted question here before we dig back down. Are you by any chance following the political debate in Texas about remembering the Alamo? Um, I am, um, and I, for reasons that I am pledged not to disclose, I have read the most recent book by three authors, and I cannot remember their names. It, and the title is something like Forget the Alamo. Um, and it, it's, it's a wonderful book because it brings up to date what we think we know about the Battle of the Alamo. And the second half of the book is related to the debates over the significance and the meaning of the Alamo since that battle was fought in the 1840s. And it's really, it's a wonderful book and it's full of comic relief. And um, a lot of the characters that in Texas are, are vaunted as heroes and so on, turn out to be um, uh, uh, men who were not uh, heroic at all. And it, reading it was a real revelation to me. And um, if, if the person who asked the question has read that book, maybe you could put it into the chat room, the name and the authors, because it's, it, it's a hugely enjoyable um, work written by three Texas journalists. And I can't imagine that they're gonna take a huge amount of heat when the book's published, which is probably about now. So if, if, if that can be put in the chat room or someone can find it in Amazon, I'd like to recommend it to everyone because it's an enjoyable history and it suggests the way in which the actual past, as far as it can be known today, is used at different times in the future of that past to alter our understanding of what went on, in this case, at the Alamo. It's terrific little work. All right, we have about 10 minutes left here. Um, so you mentioned earlier that usually history is written by the victors. And many of us think of this as referring to military victors, but you mentioned that the Confederacy lost the military battle and then triumphed politically. Uh, as part of this, they wound up writing the history of the lost cause and sold this very effectively. So somebody asked, do you know of other situations where the military losers wrote a widely accepted version of history which prevailed for a long time? Well, um, none come to mind, but um, I mean, in, in all civil wars, you're going to find this. I, mean, I think you found it in France um, after 1789. And in some respects, the question as to who won the French Revolution was fought out through the 19th and the, and the 20th centuries. It was part of the great debate in France. Um, and, and one of the reasons that happened is because those who were forced out of France in its first, in the revolution's first four years, between 1789, 1793, were allowed back in. And so French politics always included the politics of the emigres, of those against whom the revolution was originally launched. And French politics has always had that 
um, that dual nature. Now, one of the things to keep in mind about American history is that most of the loyalists who fled the colonies after 1775 and 1776 didn't come back in. They weren't allowed to come back in. And so that those who lost the war never came back to fight it. Those who were loyalists who remained in the United States were reabsorbed, but they were reabsorbed in what turned out to be a kind of general liberal consensus about the glories of an independent new nation. And surely they eventually fell out politically between the Jeffersonians and the Federalists by the year 1800, 1801. Um, there was a political battle royal um, taking place, but it all took place on the liberal side of the spectrum because the conservatives never came back in. That was not the case in France. So in a sense, the French, the French political battles are analogous to what happened in the United States after 1786 when reconstruction ended and failed. And, and American will to fight on behalf of the freed African-Americans deteriorated. I mean, we, white Americans are responsible for the failure of African-Americans to be reintegrated into American life. Northern and Southern whites are. And we're paying the price for that failure. Um, well, the book on the Alamo, before I forget here, is uh, Forget the Alamo, The Rise and Fall of an American Myth. And that was- Yes, who, who forget it. So it is called Forget the Alamo. Exactly, yes. good. I got that right, good. <laughs> Um, and so we had here a question. Let me go back and find it. Um, Yanis says, do you think we should drop the term indigenous to describe the early American immigrants from Asia who were later termed Indians, Native Americans, but were definitely not indigenous? Would that be revisionist history or correct history? You know, I, I don't think it's fair of me to intervene in that debate. I think that is something that should be debated by Native Americans. Some, by the way, prefer to be called Indians, but Native Americans and their communities, and I should not be involved. And I will, I will salute whatever they decide. I mean, it seems to me, I can understand the debate because strictly speaking, they're not indigenous, but they were here before we were, in a sense. So they were indigenous when Europeans arrived. Well, I mean, after all, were the people who inhabit Norway indigenous to Norway? No, they came from some other place. So no one, no one is indigenous in that sense, except some population, if you could find it, that's pure that is somewhere in Africa. And I don't know where you'd find it. Uh, Alan, I saw you enjoying that one. Uh, feel free to jump in if you have any thoughts as well. Um, okay, so another question here, Michael Bender asks, can a young historian in an established field make a name for themselves by writing non-revisionist history? That's a very good question. And it came up a few days uh, ago uh, um, to me. And um, I, th I think yes, because, well, I'll tell you why, because, and I said it in different terms before, because I believe that every work of history is potentially revisionist. Um, so if there are a group of studies going on about, let us say, the origins of slavery in the various colonies, and if it is generally agreed that in these 12 of the colonies that have histories of that subject already written, slavery originated on these grounds for these purposes under these circumstances, but the 13th colony doesn't have a history. If someone comes along and writes the history of the origins of slavery in that 13th colony, which more or less conforms to the history of the origins of slavery in the other 12, it's a contribution to history because it fills that gap and we didn't know about the origins of slavery in that state. It's not really arguing with those other existing histories of the other colonies, but it is contributing to it and deepening and strengthening 
that set of arguments. That doesn't mean that all 13 books won't eventually be rendered not inconsequential, but no longer adequate to what we have learned and thought since their appearance. But it does make a contribution, even though it is not in the, in, in a sense, strikingly revisionist in its contribution or its in intent. And not all young scholars start to revise. They usually argue with the histories that exhibit, but they don't set out to be revisionists. There are very few historians who do that. They stumble upon a subject and come to realize that they think that the people who have studied that subject before don't have it quite right. They've ignored these, this evidence. There's this new evidence. The arguments that were made before on the grounds of the existing evidence were faulty. They're those kinds of, but they don't set out to say, I'm going to write a dissertation and be a revisionist historian. I don't think that happens. Maybe we can end with this one. Again, thank you to everyone. We've answered about 24 questions and still have a dozen left. So a lot of interested participants here. But I wanna end with Anna who says, to what do you attribute the newfound celebration of Alexander Hamilton at this time? And is it warranted? <laughs> the New France celebration comes from a musical, <laughs> I think. Um, no, no historian of the United States or, or of the Western world who knew anything about uh, Alexander Hamilton would ever have dis discounted his importance. What, what um, the, the musical uh, did was to give Alexander Hamilton and the participants in the history of which he was a part um, a platform, a stage on which to perform. And an incredible number of people were thus educated um, into the life of Hamilton and his world. And it's pretty accurate history. Um, it could be interpreted differently. There's nothing really wrong with it. Um, and to the degree that it brought the founding fathers, which I may point out, whoever act, despite whoever acted them with whatever color skin and origins the actors had, they were all white guys. If it can bring those people back to life, and give them relevance to the people who saw that musical and know it's music, terrific. We historians will take help from anyone we can as long as it's responsible. All that we ask in return is that those people who want to deal in the past turn to us and not make it up as they go along. Great, well, thank you both so much. I know I've really enjoyed the last hour and a half. Alan, do you have any closing thoughts and then we'll come back to you, Professor Banner? I really don't, but uh, thank you. Thank you, Jim. And thanks uh, again to the uh, Columbia Alumni Association of Washington for hosting this event. I want to second that. I want to thank Kambas and Miyaku, uh, both of you, and Alan, of course. And I, uh, it's always nice to, be, be, uh, to find a former student to be every bit uh, the equal of, 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 uh, of a pair. And um, uh, Alan was a good student then, and he's a dear friend and obviously a very skilled interviewer. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Jim. And I do just want to note, we got some of your comments that the Yale website isn't working. You have to use, I think, Firefox, uh, Google Chrome, and, and uh, Microsoft aren't working. So we'll try and look into that. We did share the Amazon link. I think that is cheaper even without the discount code. So we'll send all of that out in the email tomorrow with the recording, which will be on our YouTube channel. But thank you all for coming tonight. And thank you to both of you for just a great evening. Thank you as well.